uh, a big thanks uh, uh, a big thanks to Peter and um, this was really an honor to come and and, uh, and do a chat for Rotary now and I, I really stand behind we had a little chat over there about uh, sort of their their general mission and their mission statement and uh, I think it's a I think it's a great thing you got going on and, and thanks a bunch thanks a bunch um, so one thing that I find kind of funny, and I want to thank all of you for coming on. It's a gorgeous day outside. I know it's been hotter than Hades all summer, and today it's finally like becoming uh, reasonable outside. But you have just come inside to uh, listen to a snowboarder talk about high performance. So. <laughs> Let's see. There we go. So. Uh, how does, a, how does a kid from New Brunswick, in an area with very limited uh, uh, mountains, and at a time when there was no snowboarding, how does he become a snowboarder, a, a lifelong snowboarder? So um, I, had, I definitely had some inspiration as a 11 or 12 year old in, uh, on a ski trip in Sugarloaf, and it was the uh, infancy of Resort Sports Network. Um, they were showing ski movies and I think the ski movie was by Dick Barrymore about the year before and uh, this video clip I'll show you we can start it this amazed me more than anything I'd ever seen in my whole life as an 11 year old later that day Ted Shred decided to combine his two favorite sports of powder skiing and surfing so by using his skiing surfboard and a little imagination he transforms the powder slopes of Canada into the big surf of Hawaii. So this is actually pretty local footage. It was in the Monashies. And also, if you notice, they didn't even call it a snowboard. It was before they even had a name for it. And, and even by today's standards, so that's a, that's a plywood board with a single water ski binding on the front foot, no binding on the back foot. And so it's, it was pretty amazing. I, didn't, I don't think I breathed the whole segment of this. And what I was, you know, as an 11 year old, you're like, you're, you know, and you're a skier, you're addicted to that speed and that thrill. And you didn't have the words for it, but, but what was really being displayed was like that sensation, that floating, that flying. And I've watched this probably 15 times since I found it on YouTube the other day when I knew I, would, I, knew I wanted to put it in the presentation. And back during this era, of course, we had, uh, well, not only no snowboards, but most of us, after seeing this, we're in our garage trying to build and configure snowboards and the ski hills didn't allow them either so uh, our all of us old old uh, OG snowboarders we uh, but just cruising we these started on golf courses and back hills and gravel now quarries for unsuspecting skiers to streak <laughs> And because we didn't have steel edges or bindings and such, of course, it, it was a bit of a threat on a ski hill. We wouldn't even have thought of it ourselves. And, and even really right to the bitter end, there's some cool performance here where he's actually making some turns and even when he steps off the board, just these little turns here and I was like, I felt it in my heart, you know, this was, this is what it was going to be for me.
Now, the, the funny thing again about this is it, the sport didn't even exist. So I just witnessed something on TV as an 11 year old and I'm like, I'm gonna do this the rest of my life. And my parents and everyone are like, you're crazy, like what? And I'm like, we'll, we'll figure it out, we'll find a way. Now this next slide, funny enough, just because it uh, is more in the context of what we just saw, um, is about pretty much pushed a decade forward of myself watching this. And it just sort of goes along with what, uh, what you just saw. And it's a, it's a really classic old snowboard photo of me that was a centerfold back in 93. And actually last year it was the cover of uh, uh, Snowboarder Magazine's 30th anniversary uh, issue. <laughs> And the, uh, the, the title of it in the, in the uh, centerfold was Etiquette. So full disclosure, I do know the skier. It was not a setup shot. It was shot in Greenland. It was the trip of my life. I could do a whole talk about just that trip. And um, yeah, uh, through, through the years of, you know, I, don't th I can't think of a day I didn't enjoy snowboarding. And like the learning curve back in the day when the boards were old was really, it was a, it was a big challenge. The boards were terrible and weren't meant to perform on corduroy and ski hills and such. But as the technology evolved, we, uh, we started actually pretty quickly outperforming some of the ski technology even. So one of the things is how does one take those steps towards um, a path they know they want to take? And what I realized pretty quickly uh, as a as a kid in, in high school and there's starting to be snowboard competitions and I'm going to them and I'm doing all right, but I'm not keeping up with the kids that snowboard every day. Usually the older ones that are out of, out of high school already. So for me, it was, uh, it was go where it's hot. Take yourself and immerse yourself into that environment where it's like really happening. This is a photo of, uh, well, this is the new building, um, Carabasset Valley Academy and it was a ski academy. Uh, designed specifically for ski racers back in the day to you know, for fulfill and pursue their, their dreams of high performance sport and to become a, an elite skier. There's a bunch of them in the east, in uh, New England in particular, and this one's at Sugarloaf in Maine, gorgeous mountain. Um, and I, I basically called them up as a 17 year old and I remember the, the conversation very, very well. And, and um, Vicki Robinson, the director of admissions answered and hi, and, said, my name's Mark, I'm a snowboarder, I'd love to come to your school, I know all about it from ski racing, but I, I think this snowboarding thing's gonna be, a, gonna be something, I'd love to come to school as your first snowboarder. Thanks, but we don't have a snowboard program, um, enjoy your day, click. And um, I sat there for a couple of seconds and, and uh, reorganized my thoughts, I'm like, and this, the persistence, I, I know I'm annoyingly persistent, because my mother is and my daughter is. <laughs> And, and I know it's annoying because they both do it to me. But um, I, I called right back and said, look, let me come down. I'll, I'll show you what we can do on these things and, and such. And, and they, let, they let a few of us in um, on a probationary period only. And the other, uh, the other attendee was uh, Jeremy Jones um, that same year. He heard that, oh, there's going to be a snowboarder at a ski academy, and, and his parents shipped him there. So the next... The next, um, the next move to take it to sort of that next step and, and keep continuing with being immersed in the proper environment to get you where you needed to go. Uh, back then we didn't have national teams. So it, was, it was private, independent, professional snowboard teams. And I sought out the most hardcore one, which was called Cross M. Um, just for interest's sake, depending on how many people know some of the, some of the famous snowboarders from back in the day. This one here, this is Jeremy Jones of Jones Snowboards and, and has won multiple, multiple awards for Big Mountain Rider, uh, probably ever, really, if you add up all his awards and movie parts and such as his brother's own Teton Gravity Research. This is JCJ Anderson, so he has the record for World Cup wins in, in the uh, snowboard tours and uh, 2010 Olympic gold medalist. That's myself. And this guy ran, he was the VP of marketing for Adidas International for a bunch of years in, uh, in Germany. So uh, I, I think there were a bunch of us there that learned a lot from like 
the hardcoreness of this team. And it it was you know it was run by our coach Jerry Masterpool, who his whole family was actually active military, except for him, because he thought he didn't like the confines of it, but he was actually the most militant one of all of them. Um, we spent so much time, uh, I would say even overtraining. We trained Christmas Day. We were on the road all the time. We would have really small breaks of time in between training camps. And when we say training camps, none of us really had any money. You weren't, you know, if you did really, really well, you were making hundreds of dollars a year. Um, <laughs> and uh, so we would literally camp. We would be at Mammoth and we'd be in our vans or tents and such, and it was a good way to save money. And, and he was all about that. Just put, put everything you had into it. Um, the sport was number one on your heart and soul list. So that was, uh, that was my, my time with Cross M. And throughout this time, I did well, I would say. Uh, Canadian and North American events, I could usually podium. And then the World Cup one's not really getting in there yet. And one thing I really had, um, I had a mantra, even through my era as a little ski race kid with Guy. And I would train well, I was into being you know, technically minded, but in the start gate, my, my mantra or my, my self-talk was, don't fall, don't make a mistake. That's gonna affect my outcome negatively. And I mean, right away, as soon as you use a negative word within your mantra, that's bad news. But also, it was very outcome focused. And um, I, even though I was in this this mode of like being in a in you know probably one of the most prominent training programs certainly in North America, I I still was dealing with that. I still was very outcome focused and had this uh, negative distraction towards the consequences. So at a World Cup, uh, at a home World Cup, it would have been our I think our first one at Mont Saint Anne, um, at the top of the course, I had what we would call um, an aha moment. And the funny thing about these, an aha moment, what we talk about in sport, it obviously it happens like that. It 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 hits you like a ton of bricks, and it's overwhelming, and it's an emotion as much as it is. It's almost undescribable, and. It takes you years to get to that. <laughs> like, it literally takes you years to like somehow have had those experience experiences and those knowledge and those and that, those emotions to bring that moment to arrive like arrive on your lap. Um, and I had that, and I found that just before I would have been in this sort of visual mind space. Uh, I remember I was sort of brushing my board out, brushing the wax out, and basically said to myself, forget about all the outcomes and consequences, just do my thing two gates at a time. And somehow I was able to generally let go of consequences and outcomes and just focused on the process. And, and part of it is you actually have to, to let go of the outcomes means you actually have to not care how you're gonna do, what that result is gonna be, what the time is gonna be written down next to your name on the scoreboard. And that's a really challenging thing to do that's why we train, that's why we compete, is to try, is to try and do it. So it's, it, um, it's, it's challenging for e even the best people. I watch it happen in tennis. I see people in interviews, you can catch little tips of it that you can see that they're still focused on outcome. But anyway, I had that, I had that aha moment and I won by a big margin. And I, I, I got through to the finish line and I, I even almost didn't care that that uh, what they were going to say or the announcement and I could kind of hear some cheers and things and, and uh, it's one of the bigger margins I'd ever won by. So I went on from this aha moment in around 94. Uh, that's when I had what I would call my, my good run. And so from 94 to about 2000, I won 14 World Cups, 40 international podiums. Um, and I, I, 
I had to forcefully put myself in that headspace, though. If I wasn't, though, that would be the one time I would get seventh or something. We trained enough. Again, we've overtrained. We were super prepared that even a bad day, we'd still be top 10. But to win, you really, we really found uh, myself and a couple of my other, other athletes, and we would chat about it, that you had to let go uh, of that concept of outcome. Um, in around 2000, the courses changed. They made them rounder. The Europeans kind of got a hold of uh, control of the technical aspect of the sport. And I was more of a speed freak with what the equivalent of downhill in snowboarding. And they changed it much more like a slalom, very tight and round. And the equipment changed. A lot of sponsorships and uh, sponsors fell out around that dot bomb era, if you remember that, some of you. And um, you had to adapt. And uh, I didn't. And it's funny because this outfit's just awful. <laughs> so I, I thought I'd throw it in there. <laughs> 16 years old, yeah. But um, uh, yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't adapt. And then because of that, the confidence starts to spiral and the results definitely start to spiral. spiral. Um, I relied on, this is a really bad word, in the context of sport, this is a bad word. In other areas, it's a good word. In the context of sport, the word hope is terrible. And I started relying on hope. Oh, I hope I do well. I hope my time is better than that run just felt. And if you start using the word hope, you're either woefully unprepared or you're gambling. So a quarterback, I hope, <laughs> I hope my uh, wide receiver knows this route we're about to run. Preparedness, he should be. Uh, Brady and his crew, like they're like a machine. They're super prepared, and that's why they win. His running backs and Brady's arm isn't anything magic. They're just ultra, ultra prepared. Sometimes Belichick likes to cheat to get that way. But anyway, <laughs> that's a diff different story. Um, I, I, at, during this period of pre... Uh, Pre-Salt Lake into 2002, when I started relying on hope, I also, uh, of course, was becoming more and more leaning towards being outcome focused. And someone asked, you know, about my snowboarding. I said, well, it was sort of like I, I have this passion, which led to this great, you know, a career. And now, it, now competing on my snowboard feels like a bad habit. Um, so it wasn't. It, it, it wasn't taking me on that path I wanted to continue on. It wasn't feeling right. And so much of it, again, was just my name with results. I, I put self-worth next to what that number was, whether it was, well, it wasn't first, you know? And I was like, oh, I'm like 12th in the world. I'm 21st in the world now. And uh, not, a, not a great reason to continue in sport for anyone. Uh, and after the 2002 Olympics, I finished, I finished 17th, top 16 gets to go on to this like knockout elimination of finals and I just finished 17th. And, uh, and then after that, I, uh, I retired from Alpine competition. So then I had a great time. After, after uh, Salt Lake, I made my way to Bald Face Lodge, what you saw the commercial for and was gonna visit my friends who own it and run it for a couple of days. The snow was armpit deep. I stayed for three weeks to the point where they're like, Mark, you gotta get out of the house, man. Like, go, get, <laughs> go get a hotel or something. And, uh, uh, and sort of made up my thought that I think I'm moving to Nelson, BC. Um, that next September, so that summer I had so much fun snowboarding a bit in the spring and in, in places like Baldface. I just kiteboarded and surfed and didn't have to deal with all that dry land training and all that hard stuff. And um, I went down to Chile for snowboard kiting, um, uh, which is amazing sport. And it so happened there was a World Cup in the vicinity at the same time. And I went, I thought, oh, I'll go check it out and stuff. We can kite at this place, Valle Nevado. And uh, JCJ Anderson, uh, cracked his head in the SBX a couple of days before, wasn't cleared to compete. Um, and the coach at the time was like, Mark, you're here. Like, you, you know, you actually have points profile and everything still with Fist. Why don't you jump in the race? I'm like, ah, no, I don't want 
don't want to bother. Oh, come on, you know, you can borrow JC stuff. I'm like, oh, what the heck, I'm here. You know, it'll be fun for the morning just to like try and qualify or something. <laughs> so I, uh, I borrowed all his equipment, and I'll say this. There, there's, there must be something strange that uh, I know everyone's speed suits, because uh, people that have worn speed suits before, and if you're training and racing that much, you don't get to wash them that often, and you don't really notice them yourself. <laughs> when you put someone else's on, do you ever notice them? Wow. <laughs> Um, so, and I mean, right down to the helmet, I had his boots on the works. My feet were all cramped up and I almost raced. So they do what you do a couple qualifying runs to seed the brackets of the knockouts. And I almost raced with my backpack because I had no, I had zero expectation of qualifying within the top 16. Um, and I, I didn't, I just said, oh, what the heck, I'll just go. And I just sort of looked ahead and was just in the, in the process, I had no consequence or outcome focuses running through my head, and I qualified well, I think fifth. And here it is on the, the, the final, at the end of the day, uh, I just started taking people out in the knockout rounds, and I got second. Uh, and I, and I, I used to love saying that, yeah, I did that off the couch too, you know? People have been, some of these guys, actually the 16th guy was the guy that won the Olympic gold in Salt Lake the March earlier. The guy that was third was the bronze medalist in the games, and you know, they'd been training their butts off all summer, training camps, dry land, everything, and all it took was the mindset of like, not being focused on those outcomes and consequences, I guess. And the, here's the funny thing, why I didn't win. So you, you race twice against a person because you get to switch courses. And the first run against the guy in the gold medal round, my mind went, now that I'm in, the, medal, now that I'm in the, the finals for the gold medal, I gotta do something different. I'll have to like, I'm gonna have to go harder than I normally do or something. And because of that mindset switch, I blew out in the like third corner or something. Second run, that gives you a, a maximum of like a second and a half disadvantage. I made up 1.48, so I like just missed it. But um, uh, again, just sort of all speaking to that, how powerful that mental game uh, and that mindset is. So after that, um, I never ever stopped my passion and my love for snowboarding. And I found the only thing better than riding perfect powder and, and uh, in, in these amazing environments that we get to do is sharing that experience with other people. And snowboarding had been such a selfish thing for myself. And you'll talk to a lot of athletes that, that say that. They're like, yeah, when you're an athlete, like, wow, I'm, I must have been hard to deal with. There's a, lot, there's a lot of selfishness going on when you're an athlete at that level. And this felt so right to be able to take people out. This is, again, Bald Face Lodge. To be able to take people out uh, and guide them around the backcountry and show them sometimes the time of their lives. And I remember one guy coming up and, like, holding me by the arms. And he's like, that was amazing. And we, we write down in our books a lot, you know, uh, uh, snow observations and stuff for avalanche safety, et cetera. And we usually rate the run or rate the snow quality out of 10. And he was like, he could see I was working on it. He's like, what was that? That was incredible. It was like the best run of my life. I'm like, no, oh, that was a five. And he was like, it gets better than that. I can't believe it. <laughs> and, and those are just fantastic moments, being able to, uh, being able to show people around out there. And, and for a lot of them, they, you know, they come out at the end, and like that was the best three days of snowboarding or skiing in my life. And some of them even say best days of my life. Um, I also got to do a television show during this time, which was really fun. And that was sort of a way to share uh, snowboarding as a sport in general and the non-competitive side of it. And that was just really an honor, I guess, and super fun. And same sort of thing happened. People were like, why didn't you keep the show going? And I'm like, oh, you know, the producer, he was having twins, I was getting married. and. We both made about 500 bucks in five months total, so I think, I think, it, was, I think it was time, unfortunately. So to take it one step further, um, around 2005 and a half, I got a call from, from uh, JC. He said, do you think you could come coach? And I said, oh, I don't know. Not, I didn't really even think about it, to be honest. I said, that working on this guiding thing. And Canada Snowboard called and said, JC wants you to coach. Here's a carrot. 
and it was better than the $500 I made the last year, so I went for it. <laughs> and, and funny enough, my first, my first job, um, uh, my first job as a coach was the head coach for the national team, an Olympic team. <laughs> So, uh, uh, and I'd coached rowing and some other things before, so it wasn't uncomfortable, but um, it was great. And you know, to me, coaching is having, as a definition, is having a positive and impactful influence on an athlete's pathway. Um, and so it was great, and we had some young athletes, Matt Morrison there, and again, that's JC. And we had a great run from 2006 through 2010. We won a pile of, uh, pile of events as a team. JC won the 2010 games. I felt a little bit um, um, rewarded, I guess. For, in 98, I was ranked number one and my binding blew out in the race. That's, that's another TED talk at some point. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that was nice. That was really, uh, really a great time. So to take it even, even another step further, um, I got to work, this is just this past uh, February, I guess, here in Vancouver, and I got to work with the Paralympic movement and Paralympic uh, um, snowboarding that Canada and our, our, some of our people in our office actually were really uh, involved in the inception of para snowboarding. And it was really an honor to work with uh, this massively in inspirational crew of athletes. And some of them were just snowboarders, some of them were barely snowboarders before. Some had come from a little bit of athletic um, uh, sport prior and some really none. And it, you know, the Paralympic movement gives gives some of these athletes that have been through something pretty traumatic or what have you, the loss of a limb, et cetera, and they feel, I think, at the time that, okay, oh, that's it, I'm never gonna be able to do this again or that again, and like, I'll never be able to compete at, at a high level. And it gives them that opportunity. And it was, uh, uh, we, had, we had an athlete, the big guy in the middle, and he won two X Games medals. We had a full, full para border cross for a few years, and Prior to his uh, loss of, of a leg in a boating accident, he, he had a bunch of friends from his Toronto area that were actually getting to go to the X Games for different events and such. And he was sort of down about that, that he you know, sort of accepted he'd never get to go. Then he lost his leg and got back rolling on snowboarding and he's like, opportunities opened up for him. And um, it, you know, it was really, uh, it was really a different sport to be involved with, very family-like, um, a lot better camaraderie amongst nations and the, and the athletes and the teams. And, um, you know, many on the team achieved accomplishments they never dreamt they would before losing a limb or having some sort of traumatic accident. They all also have a great sense of carpe diem. So that's refreshing a them automatically have let go of outcome stuff. They're like, I'm just lucky. I'm glad to be here for another day. Um, and, you know, I still continue to work with this. A uh, few of them have retired now and such, and some are coming back. I actually have one of my athletes here, Daniel Shoemaker. Raise your right arm. No. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> and Dan was, with, Dan was with the crew here for a bunch of years and is going to be coming back here in a couple, in a couple of years for... Uh, a crack at it in, uh, in China. Um, so the big thing is you're like, well, what the heck is this paradox he's talking about? What is, what is this paradox? And I knew that it related to this aha moment I had back a bunch of slides ago. And, and to, to put it into words would have filled a notebook. And, it, and it, again, it took years to arrive at that aha moment of somehow doing something with the outcomes and yet still being focused and, and such. And um, while coaching, this would have been in like 2008 or something, we had a professional development day and they brought in uh, a gentleman who ended up working with Snowboard for a long time, uh, Dr. David Cox from San, uh, SFU from Simon Fraser University. And he made this statement and I nearly fell out of my chair because he put it into one sentence, the whole thing into one sentence. Oops, hit the wrong button. 
There it is. The likelihood of achieving an outcome goal increases when you let go of the need to have it. So, and, and sometimes it even, I'll say that, I'll say this to athletes and they don't get it. Because you, some, I think you actually have to have those experiences to arrive at that feeling. So it's not words, this is a, this is a, a state of mind. And uh, again, I was like, man, it took me like four years, my coach and I and chats and this and that and losing lots of races and to, to uh, arrive at that one sentence that you have. <laughs> so uh, uh, I really got to thank David for that one. <laughs> now, the paradox also is, is not to be confused by it because a lot of people, um, they think it means something else. And there's a few things it does not mean. There's a few things it does not mean. Doesn't mean use less effort. So that concept of letting go of the need and such, it doesn't mean less effort. Doesn't mean don't care. And I've had athletes try these and they're like, well, I did what you said. I, I used <laughs> the likelihood of achieving an outcome goal increases when you let go of the need to have it. That's what I was doing. No, you weren't. And then the, uh, the other one is just spending less time training or preparing. You absolutely, if, if you want to be at the top, this is paramount. This is huge, this last one. Now, one thing, uh, Dr. David Cox had a definition of a really important word within the, within the context of sport again, kind of like hope. So this one, intensity. And th this is really critical to it. This is the part that um, uh, part of your mindset and that stimulation level that needs to be right on and very balanced or it's not going to happen for you or you're not going to be performing at your best, basically. And his definition for intensity was focused emotion. And I found that very impactful in, uh, again, I wish I had known some of these terms when I was actually competing, but as a coach, these are very impactful words and, and being able to use these with the athletes and, and identify with them. I've had athletes full of emotion, no focus, and the Tasmanian devil on speed, you know, They're and nothing's gonna go well. And I've had athletes just hyper-focused, but like you need a large, Canadiano coffee right now, like you have no emotion going into this at all. Like, yeah, it looks perfect, but it's at like 30%. So this was a really big one. And how it relates to the paradox is, from, from my perspective, one of the biggest things that I see that weighs people down within the context of that paradox is, you know, uh, what I call like a heart and soul's priorities list. And I said earlier, when I was with that that like hardcore militant team that uh, it was sort of an expectation that you put your heart and soul into that program and into your training and, and such and sport was number one. And sport can be number one possibly on a timeline. In other words, you might end up spending more time sport than you do with your family. But what is more important? So I say that all the time to my wife. I'm like, you guys are way more important to me than what I'm doing as a coaching or athlete and such. But it does so happen that I have to spend 200 days a year away on the, on the road with the team, et cetera. Um, but finding these priorities, you know, these are mine, for instance. I mean, you can have your own list. But these are, the, these are things that I put way ahead, all of these, ahead of competitive sport. Competitive sport would and maybe even be further down the list. I could probably find a few more things that th these take priority for my heart and soul. And when, when I hear people say they put, I put my heart and soul into my sport, that might be a bad thing. I can see them, you can put that in, you can put that in, but as soon as you put your heart and soul into it, then you're adding to that, you're like piling up on the wrong side of the balance for that paradox. And, um, I think you're greatening the likelihood of yourself to become outcome focused if you put 
your heart and soul into some of these sports. Then all of a sudden the consequences are really big. And when you crash out or something, you're broken. And then you have a fear of being broken and it's just this sort of vicious cycle. And, uh, and I've, seen, I've seen that happen, but it's always been a big thing for me. Also, for athletes, when they come out at the end of, the, at the end of their run, you know, you want them to be in their sport for life and you want them to have the passion about it and such. And if they've put everything in, and I've had athletes put everything in, and then, you know, at the big event, you know, their dreams are a bit dashed. They didn't do what, where they expected. I don't like that word expectations within the, the confines of sport either context. And, uh, and they never snowboard again. I, I had, I've had two of them. I've had one teammate and one athlete. Just hung it up, gone. And like, I can't even imagine that. And, uh, and I, I, you know, if I could jump in the time machine and go back, I think I would have more, more chats with them about this. Make your list. Make your list. You know, what is more important to you? And again, don't confuse that with the fact that you still got to train. <laughs> you still have to do this. But you can do that with intensity, not your heart and soul. Um, that is my presentation. There you go. Thank you. Any questions for Mark? Oh, sure. No, I've heard this for five years in a row. So. <laughs> yeah. it's a You've gotten the spiel. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Ask anything. And it doesn't have to be about the presentation. It could be about anything snowboarding or anything. Skiers. Skiers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Not young, but snowboarders. Snowboarders, yeah. Who races? You guys race? Awesome. You race? Mark, where would you put the EEPPTT into any of these? I had that in there. I didn't want to have it to go too long, but okay. what, what he's referring to are your, your pillars, your pillars of high performance. And you'll hear of these in business and religion and all sorts of things. And we have in Canada Snowboard, um, we have like a, a, an acronym that doesn't spell anything <laughs> for, for, our, for our pillars of high performance. Environment, equipment, <coughs> physical, psychological, technical, and tactical. And uh, again, like anything else, as soon as you have imbalances in those, you know, I, I, I visualize it like these, these big uh, pillars that hold up a roof. And is you know wherever your your shortest pillar is, that's where your roof starts to cave in. And um, I put that in where where I actually had it, and I wanted to chat about it, but it was going to take too long. Is where adapt or die, and that was a place where at least myself, I didn't I didn't reflect back and look and and say, okay, hey, I'm like way off on equipment here now. In '98, I had the best equipment in the world. In 2002, I actually had the worst equipment there, and it made a huge difference made a massive difference. And then as soon as your equipment's low, your confidence spirals and all sorts of different things. And then, so your equipment pillar drags down your psychological one. Your psychological pillar is so bridged and attached to all the other ones. So, yeah.